recorded. So um, we'll give people a few minutes. It takes people a few minutes to jump into the meeting. And so while we're doing that, I will just welcome folks to the webinar. Um, it's best to view the webinar in the gallery form. If, if you're not sure about that, it's in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. And you can uh, choose gallery view, which will allow you to view all the panelists at once. So welcome to Millicent Unplugged at the Millicent Rogers Museum. We are lo located on ancestral lands of the Tiwa speaking people known today as the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. We strive to deepen our relationship with the Red Willow people through collaboration while acknowledging and honoring the complex history of the Red Willow people, past, present, and future. We express gratitude to this land and to the Taos Pueblo elders and ancestors who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Tonight's topic is New Mexico's starry night, science, spirit, and space flight. I'm sure everybody's gonna enjoy this lively conversation. New Mexico is home to several dark sky areas where people can view the night skies with clarity due to altitude and dry air along with low population density. We welcome our guests in conversation this evening as we traverse insights and inspiration from a variety of perspectives. The idea of this topic came about because of Millicent's inspired designs, one of which I am wearing, Pleiades star, running star pin, and Sarah tonight has Vega on her hat, Vega on her hat, right? Okay, uh, she had a curiosity about the natural wor world that emerges in many of her jewelry designs, reminding us that the night skies of New Mexico are a treasure to behold just as the ancients saw them. So tonight, um, we're going to do the intro a little bit different. I actually want to read our guests' bios because they are so robust with information, and I want to make sure that all of the people attending the, the program um, have a chance to get the foundation of what this conversation is going to look like. So welcome, Joyce Gusick. Joyce has been a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory for 35 years. She earned a PhD in astrophysics from Iowa State University in 1988. In addition to research in support of Los Alamos's national security mission, she has continued astrophysics research, modeling the interior and oscillations of the sun and many other types of pulsating variable stars. Since 2009, Joyce has focused on analysis of photometric data from the NASA Kepler and TESS spacecraft. She occasionally gives lectures about her research for the Pajarito Environmental Education Center in Los Alamos and currently is vice president of the Pajarito Astronomers Amateur Club. Welcome, Joyce. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We also have Michael Alberts. We want to welcome Michael. Michael is a passionate explorer and researcher contemplating human spirituality and its relation to the cosmos. He is a longtime student of Vedic and Western astrology, vibrational radiesthesia, and biogeometry, forms of energy medicine, with a focus on the ancient mysteries of Egypt. Michael is president of the Sangre de Cristo Anthroposophical, did I say it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> Group. Anthroposophical, yes. All right. A nonprofit organization dedicated to the path of knowledge, guiding the spiritual in the human being to the spiritual in the universe. Re residing in Albuquerque since 2001, um, Michael works in the healthcare information technology field. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining us. And Loretta Hall is the author of six nonfiction books about human space exploration. She especially enjoys highlighting New Mexico's valuable contributions to getting astronauts to the moon and supporting the development of the commercial space industry. 
She also has a particular interest in the history of women in aeronautics. Loretta's most recent books are adult and children's versions of the life story of Wally Funk, a Taos native who holds the record as the oldest woman to travel to space. Loretta is a space ambassador for the National Space Society, a board member of New Mexico Press Women and recipient of the National Federation of Press Women's Communicator Achievement Award. Having lived in Albuquerque for 45 years, she considers herself an honorary native New Mexican. So thanks for being here, everybody. Welcome, Loretta. Thank you. Sarah, let's get us started. Well, goodness, I, I, the way I get it started is I have to honor a friend of mine. And in doing that, I am changing my background to a picture that is made by my good friend, Bob Coates from Sedona. He is a specialist in photography of the Milky Way, not from a, a <laughs> space, but something that he teaches. And so I thought it might be inspirational to see all those uh, billions and billions, if I dare quote, uh, <laughs> there they are. So we have such a diversity here uh, and guests. Um, okay, so we have heliosiosmology, we have space and air exploration, and we have super sensibility guided by the heavens. I mean, how could we be more diverse? Uh, of course, that's part of what the museum does is diversity. So I'm uh, getting started on the conversation. I suppose, Loretta, I really need to start with you because everybody wants to know about your good friend and co-author, Wally Funk. And would you tell us a little bit about uh, getting to know her and working with her and her adventure? Well, she's one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. She is has um, an extremely positive attitude and uh, that that's what it carried her through through her life. You know, she she grew up in Taos, but uh, went away to college and learned to be a pilot. And then in 1960, um, just after the Mercury astronauts were chosen, uh, Dr. Loveless, who had uh, done the astronaut physical exams here in Albuquerque, um, wanted to test some women to see it, how they would perform on the same tests. And so Wally volunteered for that program and was one of the 13 women who passed those tests. And so basically she'd been trying to get into space since 1960. And um, she tried all sorts of different things. She hit roadblock after roadblock along the way, but never gave up, kept that positive attitude, persevered, and by golly, she finally made it last year at the age of 82 with a suborbital flight with Blue Origin. So um, she's just a, a fantastic person and um, a real role model for women achieving things in male-dominated fields. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get acquainted with her originally? Well, I, I of course, had read about her as, as I'm a student of space history and, and women in particular. And so I knew who she was, but about five years ago, I was giving a talk at um, the Women in Aviation International Conference. And it, the talk was about women space pioneers of New Mexico. So as I was setting up my equipment and getting ready to start the talk, I looked up and here Wally is walking into the room to hear my talk. And of course, she's one of the people I was gonna be talking about. So when I got to that point in my speech, I said, okay, this next person is sitting right there. And Wally, if I say anything that isn't quite true, correct me. So I went through my, my talk and after the talk was over, she came up, gave me a big hug and we've just been fast friends ever since. She is, she's a real people person, very friendly. And um, I just, as an author, felt that it was extremely important for her to tell her story mm -hmm. and I kept urging her to do that and finally she said well would you help me with it so that's how we got to working together on it so 
So a star-crossed acquaintanceship, if we can be <laughs> romantic in the Shakespearean sense. <laughs> and that that's a long, long history. And Joyce, you've got a huge long history. Uh, I mean, now uh, close on four decades of your work in the industry. Talk to us more about this um, study um, of the helioseismology. I don't really understand what it is, except that um, it, studying particularly in this case, the shape of the sun through sound waves uh, and I guess caused by heat and convection on the surface. You, you did your research well. You, <laughs> you Very nice definition. Oh, good. Yeah, it's one of my favorite subjects. I learned about it in the, uh, when I was in grad school around in the mid 80s, when the, the whole field started really taking off. So um, helio uh, means sun. And, you know, you see the word helio is also he, in the word helium, right? Um, because we first discovered helium on the sun originally um, in, these, in these spectral lines in the sun. So um, seismology is just like studying um, earthquakes to figure out what's going on inside the sun. Um, the stars also have star quakes. They vibrate um, up and down. And there's various different kinds of modes, like there are different kinds of modes in geology, P waves and S waves, which I'm not an expert in, but the sun vibrates in acoustic modes or sound modes. So it has many different harmonics of sound waves going on in the inside, excited by convection, just like you said, um, boiling motions at the surface of the sun, um, get these waves going and they propagate all the way through the sun and back out again, um, kind of like the earthquake waves do. So by looking at those waves on the surface, we can figure out what's going on all the way in the center of the sun, which I think is really cool because we can't see the inside of the sun, right? Just like we don't know what's in, in the center of the earth. Um, we don't, we can't look at the sun directly. So um, we've used these waves to understand understand um, what the central temperature is and composition inside the sun and the, um, the pressure and the density is a function of radius. So, and we've started to look at these waves on many other stars. It's harder on other stars because they're so far away. So for other stars, the field is called astero seismology. So aster is like the word, is the word for star and seismology. So the TESS and Kepler spacecraft that I've been working with data on um, has been giving us a lot of data on other stars and seismology of other stars. So that's been a wonderful- Absolutely thing. amazing. And you know what you said leads me directly to Michael because you talked about the vibrations and that is uh, that is a word that is used very much in Michael's field of research. Um, things that are past, or I'm not sure past is the right word, but beyond what is um, a, directly perceivable by the human senses and how we can harness, uh, well, find these things, understand them, harness them, apply them to living. So if, if Michael, can you take that part of the, the vibration away and tell us about yes. that? <laughs> yeah, so the, the vibrational spectrum that we on Earth are subject to through the cosmos is really, a, we only experience, sure you know, a very narrow band. But there are, you know, the, the entire uh, spectrum from, you know, visible light, ultraviolet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These can be uh, detected through the use of pendulums and, and other, other tools. The Egyptians and cultures before that we, that we don't know about were, were aware of these and, and able to, to use them. And so this was part of their uh, way to connect their own uh, sense sensory apparatus with, with those of the outer stars. So the, the whole science of vibrational radiesthesia, where you can use different pendulums to re resonate with different um, wavelengths. And I think resonance 
is the key word there that where you set up a um, a harmonic state with uh, these energies that are otherwise imperceptible. I, I that's way far out for all of us to understand, but we can hear the words and then begin to say, okay, what does yes. that mean to us? Um, a and it it begs the question that I have to Loretta, what was the sensory perception? What were the vibrations that um, you have experienced in uh, your research about flight and your, um, I, and what, what, what happened to Wally? What did she report that she found in, in what's admittedly just a, not very far above the earth really? Right. Yeah, she just <clears throat> barely made it past the the internationally accepted definition of space, which is um, 100 kilometers or 62 miles. But um, so her her glimpse was just that a glimpse. Um, it was very satisfying to her, obviously, because she had achieved her lifelong dream. But um, in in reading and speaking with other astronauts describing their experiences, um, it, it is a very, um, e well, I'll say emotional or um, perhaps philosophical experience of, of being separated by space from the home planet where humanity has historically, this is the only place humanity has lived. And to be away from that place, and look back at the Earth as a for as a, a distant object is um, is just a, a life changing event, and and to be out in space and looking beyond the Earth at at the the rest of the cosmos, and uh, one one astronaut very specifically talked about uh, his experience of 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 realizing that in three dimensions, which Karen, you mentioned in our pre-meeting pre con, um, conversation, but at, when we look at the sky, it, it kind of appears two-dimensional. But when he could go out there and see, he could see that he, he could appreciate that this star is closer than that star over there. And, and it really gave him that feeling of an infinite dimension. It was very, very powerful. Interesting. And, and Joyce, that's what you work with every day. This, this distance, you were, you were explaining how with the astro seismology, that's more difficult to study because mm -hmm. of the huge distances and, and the right. dimensionality. Um, and so you work in this just a wild place that, that and how how is that different how how has that changed how you perceive maybe life on earth well i'm not sure how it's changed well okay life on earth that is something we've always wondered if there's life elsewhere right and recently because of the data we've been getting from kepler tests and now with the James Webb Space Telescope, we are finding many, many more planets around other stars. We didn't know of a single planet around another star, you know, 50 years ago. And, and now we, we know of thousands of them, thanks to the, the data we've gotten. So the next thing we're trying to do is see if we can find um, a planet that's in the habitable zone around a star, a, a planet that has liquid water, that has the right temperatures to sustain life. Um, maybe life doesn't need water. Maybe there's some type of life form that isn't like us, that doesn't need those same that same chemistry. But we're starting to be able to, by watching a planet pass in front of a star, like, um, kind of like an eclipse, only we're, we're viewing it from so far away, we can't we can't resolve that. We have to look at the, the light dim from the star and then get brighter again as the planet goes in front of it. And all we're getting is just this very faint brightness of the star going down and then back up. We can um, watch the star, the planet go in front, and we can look through 
use the star's light to look through the atmosphere of the planet and start to figure out what the chemistry is of the surface of this planet. So I think that not in the not far distant future, we're going to have some planet candidates that may have life on them, whether it's intelligent life, I don't know, we'll be able to see there's chemistry there that indicates there's some kind of life, maybe it's uh, photosynthesis going on or something. Um, so I think that'll be a really exciting change. I mean, go from now as a kid, there, I thought, well, there's no way we're ever going to be able to tell if there's life on another planet unless they communicate with us directly and they have to do it because we don't have the means. But now I think we'll be able to tell that whether there's life on some planets. And I think in not too far away, we'll be able to find some pl planet candidates that have life on them. So. If you would go just a little bit further, um, it, not everybody knows about the capability of the new telescope. And would you um, would you speak to that in in relatively simple terms, how that has extended your view into deep space? Okay, so uh, this is the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched on Christmas Day of last year. And the mirrors, the, the number of mirrors it has, the surface area is much larger than what was on the Hubble Space Telescope. It's like, I forget, six times the area. So that means it can collect more light for a given amount of pointing it at some place in space. So it can find fainter and fainter objects. So they're trying to look back all the way to the beginning of the universe, which they believe by, you know, looking at the expansion of of uh, galaxies away from us happened about 13.7 billion years ago. And they're trying to find galaxies that form just after that. And we're even looking for galaxies where there's no elements other than hydrogen and helium that formed in the, in the Big Bang. Maybe their, their carbon wasn't made, oxygen wasn't made, nitrogen wasn't made. And trying to get an idea of when did that happen and how did that set off the subsequent uh, star formation and evolution of the galaxies. So that's one thing it's going to learn. Um, this thing about the planet, there's many things. That's that's one thing it's going to be looking for. Looking at the chemistry of, of planets around other stars is another thing. Um, this telescope is tuned to look at the infrared wavelengths, whereas the um, Hubble looked more in the optical, so more of our visual. So the, the infrared, you can see through dust better, a bit more, more correctly, I guess, the dust reflects light and then uh, in the infrared, and that's what they're able to see. So they can they can penetrate um, a lot of things with this telescope that would be obscured if we looked at them in the, vis in the visible. So they're just starting to get, if you saw the first 10 or so images are out there of a, a variety of science that we're going to be able to answer some questions about. Uh, it sounds completely mystical spiritual yeah. and yet it is science and mm -hmm. i it, the enormity of it is yeah. is mind-boggling of course Definitely. and and michael um yeah. in 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 uh reference to what uh joyce has just explained about the the possibilities of this new reach into outer space um when when we were in Egypt together, um, and you were uh, listening to the uh, vibrations in the pyramid, where we had a, a chance to go into the Great Pyramid and all, um, how do you feel? What what did the ancients do that reached uh, some distance? Because obviously they knew a bunch. They didn't know what what we're going to know now, but they knew many things. How did they do that? Well, the, the stars spoke, spoke to humanity. There was a, an active engagement with the stars. And, and rather than focusing on the presence of life beyond, the stars were recognized as great abodes of consciousness. And it, it's consciousness that is, is the factor from, the, from another perspective beyond, beyond the, the, the physical. And in our age today, we've really perfected and enhanced our understanding of the material aspects of our universe, but really we're, we're still so far behind in our reckoning of uh, 
our own personal relationship. So one of Rudolf Steiner's uh, favorite quotes of, of mine is that, I'll just briefly say it, that the stars once spoke to human beings. It's world destiny that they are silent now. And so what we're dealing with now is that silence. And I think which causes such a fascination for everyone. And so to be aware of that silence becomes pain for earthly humanity. And this pain or this tension that develops, the looking out at the Milky Way and knowing what, what is out there, that there is a, a memory of what used to be. And now that the stars are silent, uh, really causes a, a need or a yearning to look far beyond. And with, with all these wonderful uh, technological advances to see further and further and more distinctly just what, what is out there from a physical standpoint. Uh, I think what the task of humanity is today and for everyone is to speak back to the stars in a way uh, in the form of uh, working on one's own inner being and learning to what uh, what they have to offer us. Now, for instance, in the the zodiac. The, the stars of the zodiac uh, are actually you know, in the in this reckoning. The cherubim, uh, one of the high, one of the highest celestial hierarchies uh, out there, and they were directly involved in the formation of human beings you know, from you know, from the dawn of time, and so. Looking at the stars, you know, beyond just the, the physical, that's the, for me, the lure of everything to really bring us into that capability, but to get, get with the stars and uh, know that they are abodes of consciousness as well. And they see and care about us you know, in, in, a very, in, a, in a very basic fundamental way. Uh, it, it's very interesting to uh, to meld science, transcendental religion, and that none of these things are mutually exclusive. Uh, I find that very interesting that that happens. And I will have to admit that I am a terrible junkie for just going on airplanes. Uh, that the idea of moving into the heavens has always fascinated me. I can't see well enough. Otherwise, um, well, I, I discovered piloting late in life and, and spin training was wonderful, scary at first, but then I got to it. And if I'd had a chance, I would have been out there with Wally Funk. Uh, but it's not a possibility. Um, and it, it, Loretta, in your um, writing and your audience, do you see just this same fascination? Here's the science, here's the spiritual. Do you see this coming together? I see it mostly in, in terms of um, astronauts who have spent time in space. Uh, that, because the experience, um, they, they all uniformly say that it's, it's a life-changing experience. To look back on the earth from a, from afar and and to look more deeply into the rest of the universe. So they some some of them experience it on on a religious level, some on more of a philosophical level, um, some just on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been inspired to become artists to try and convey that some of that sense to the rest of us. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a very, very powerful experience. I, I can certainly see that. Um, Karen, was... you've been trying to make a comment. Yeah, I've been just sitting here like with bated breath waiting. So ah. what, I, what I'm seeing is that there really seems to be coming forward a place where science and spirit um, have a meeting ground is that um, with the technology that has expanded and hearing words on both sides of that story, like harmonics, that um, just sort of bridge those gaps between um, spirit and science that used to exist. And what's so exciting to me about it, too, is that to kind of circle back to New Mexico um, 
And uh, here's an example, just not too long ago, there was a group of people at the museum and conversation was happening in the lobby. And um, one of the comments I made to one of the gentlemen was, oh, you need to get up at 3 a.m. and look at the sky. <laughs> and this never would have occurred to him ever. And he was just stunned. And I said, yeah, that's part of why people come to New Mexico. And I think I know from my own personal experience, because I came to New Mexico in 2005 and was in the Pacific Northwest where it's cloudy 300 days of the year, you know, um, that there are so many people who are not aware of the night sky. And yes, we can watch it on video, but to ex experience it is humbling. And I think too that that Millicent felt that. In fact, I brought some of her drawings. I want to share one because Millicent designed. And if we think about how fast things have changed in the last 100 and 150 years, people can't see the stars the way they could. And I'm wondering, Michael, if that's part of the silence. But there's one drawing here. Huh. Okay, look. Can you all see that? This, mm -hmm. um, they're actually, they, these are made into pins and called um, running, running uh, dragon and, or flying dragon. But when I was doing some research, the biogeometrics, the signatures, that's mm -hmm. what it looked like. And then at the same time, Joyce and Loretta, what I saw were some videos of, it was, it was NASA um, deep field space. And at the end of the video, they're coming back in towards earth. And then there's this very almost, do you guys remember Spirograph? Mm -hmm. Almost like sure. those kind of images that it like resembled some of Millicent's designs too. So it's like the arts and the science really are coming together and I think that's an amazing um, thing to rejoice in as a people. And the more people look up at the sky, then we can care better for the earth. I, I'd like to pursue this idea, of the talk of the geometry mm -hmm. of it. And uh, Loretta, my question goes to you first, because obviously what we can experience, flight just we take it for granted, but it is based on the geometrics of the, how do you make a wing that will lift you off the ground and yeah. all. And so that we know that that happened, of course, well, more than a hundred years ago, it basically. And how do you see that geometry has uh, accelerated the ability in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 to 20 years? Uh, when you've been writing about women in space and all? Well, I, what, it, what comes to my mind first is, is the ge geometry of trajectories of the planets and, and the celestial mechanics that, that is involved in trying to fly from the Earth, say, to Mars. And because they're, they're both moving in different directions all the time, and you have to aim, if you will. You have to plan not not just to fly from here to there, but from here now to where there is going to be by the time you get there. And that that's very complex geometry, but it's the key to spaceflight. That's interesting, and of course, that's something that uh, Michael, you you and I saw, of course in, in um, Egypt in the alignment of much of the ancient building where it mirrored constellations. Uh, yes. Remind me about the, the, the pyramid uh, the, that are in the Cairo uh, area. Yes, well, the, the, the pyramids of the Giza Plateau are, are aligned with the constellation of uh, Orion principally with the, the belt of Orion and the, the pyramids really are anchor, is a sort of an anchor and focus point between the earth and the heavens and the beings in the heavens that 
li live in the stars or for lack of a you know, better, more precise term, are part of the, the beingness that we, that the ancients were able to perceive. Now that perception in our day and age is, is, is lost because you know, many, many factors obviously, but the, the whole thing about geometry, you know, the, in the school of Pythagoras, the, the site on the wall, you, you may not enter if you do not know geometry. Now, geometry is the, uh, you know, the thought forms of the mind of, of God in, in, the, in the, you know, the very basic sense where all of the forms and patterns are complex geometrical shapes and patterns that uh, are responsible for, for everything. And do you see that also, Joyce, in your um, it, it literally mapping various parts of this galaxy and others? Do you see geometrical patterns emerging? Um, what was coming to mind when you were, um, especially when Karen was talking to me, was the, the spiral galaxies. Right. Um, you've seen those in, I think they had one today called the cartwheel galaxy. It had a beautiful mm -hmm. ring with these things going out. And then the Webb telescope even showed some more fine detail in the center, like a ring inside the mm -hmm. ring. It looked like the spiral, um, not, it wasn't a spirograph, but it was, it reminded me of that, as you said. So um, we're, and science, not me, but other scientists try to use um, the orbital dynamics and gravitational um, modeling of different bodies as they pull on each other to try to figure out how those structures came about. And that one they said came about because of an interaction of that galaxy with another galaxy that collided with it. So think of like the whole Milky Way, not just one planet or one star, but the whole galaxy colliding with another galaxy and just kind of shredding it and putting, making the spirals and, and making rings. Uh, it also looked like a firework to me. You know, we see the fireworks on and the 4th of July and all the cool patterns now that they're able to make. And a lot of those, we're seeing those in in the web images, which are yeah. really, it, I'm, I'm kind of associating mm -hmm. them as I, you know, watch fireworks displays over the years. So that's what I was thinking of. But they are trying and they are successful in making these patterns by doing computer simulations of interacting galaxies. So... It's pretty cool. Uh, that's an extraordinary uh, look into the future of what we may be able to see. And just those pictures from the telescope in, um, in six months are astonishing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so beautiful. Uh, we, we get the idea that we want to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely crazy. And yet, why not? Uh, I, and Joyce, I do have a practical question. Uh, in your research, particularly um, in the uh, helioseismology, so research with the sun, um, and can you give us any thoughts from your research how uh, this, uh, the wavelengths in the sun is affecting our um, the solar activity affecting our um, evolving climate and what people here are causing climate change, um, regardless of any human intervention. Yeah. Yeah, is there a, any, any relationship? Yes, there is some. Um, the sun goes through an 11 year sunspot cycle or solar cycle where the magnetic axis actually flips. The North Pole becomes the South Pole after 11 years. And this is because um, the sun's surface in this around the equator is going faster than the poles, and it just kind of winds itself up, winds the magnetic field up until it breaks out into sunspots and flares. So we're getting an increased amount of solar activity right now. And I think it's true, yeah, I think this is right, that with that, we get only, we, it sounds like a little bit, but every little bit matters, two-tenths of a percent increase in the amount of um, heat radiance, a total energy coming from the sun to the earth, two tenths of a percent. Doesn't sound like much, but you have to factor it in to the local, to the climate models. And 
climate modelers are aware of it. Now, over very, very long times, billions of years, um, if we use our standard model of the sun, the sun was cooler five billion years ago. It was smaller, 30% um, as bright as it is now when it first formed. And in the future, it's going to be getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And after a few hundred or million or a billion years, it's going to be too hot on the earth. We're not going to be able to stay here. So um, even though the sun will continue to burn hydrogen into helium and make energy, we'll just be too close, right? So we're going to have to move out. I think we're going to have to go to those, you know, Mars or Jupiter moons or something to to kind of back ourselves off if we're here. I hope we are here in 100 million years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so we're, we're talking about the health of the race, not just our individuals. Yeah, that's, that's a I, long time. <laughs> uh, and Michael, you're in healthcare yes. uh, on a daily basis. Um, and do you find that some of your research in, in this, the spirit behind the science, does this help you in any way, helping to guide people into a more holistic um way of living themselves that heals them? Well, I, I wish I had the, the interactivity with uh, patient population, and, and I, I do not. No, I'm more or less trying to assist the uh, healthcare practitioners to be more uh, efficient and uh, with their charting, but I, I think it's safe to say that uh, people you know, want to heal and want to get that relationship with, uh, with, with their providers. And so uh, I think the awareness of, of the sun and the, the planets in the sky and the atmosphere, all of which are, you know, factors that we deal with in the, you know, the evolving climate change that, that we see is, is certainly a big, a big aspect. That, that's more my, my day job. And unfortunately, I don't get to interact with that on the spiritual basis that I, that I would like to. But um, yeah, cer certainly a factor. Certainly. Well, I, 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 this is kind of a different question for Loretta um, with the problems for the public, okay, of just ordinary travel to see grandma or to go um, explore Masu Picchu or whatever you're going to do. How do you see... Um, just literally our own flying around our our planet how what's going to happen as far as the the future and lack of pilots and problems with overcrowding in the air and all oh well that's that's really not my area of expertise but i i mean clearly it's going to be an issue um uh, with um and I'm thinking more in terms of space travel, which is more what I am involved with. Um, the problem of space debris is something that that we we really have to address very quickly, because that is good. That makes it more difficult to launch uh, vehicles either into orbit. I mean, we we're seeing frequently uh, very satellites, including. The International Space Station having to adjust their orbits in order to avoid collisions with space debris. Um, so uh, that that's more where where my my mind is is going rather than than airplane travel. So it's kind of like um, the the floating of plastic bottles out in the Pacific. <laughs> There's so much trash in space that you have to figure out to. <laughs> How you're going to avoid everything? Right. <laughs> uh, that's that's a good ecology thing. And Karen it has an idea. Yes. I well, I want to share something that's in the chat right now first, but I'll segue because it's kind of along the same lines. So Eileen Keller is saying, um, as far as space de debris, how interesting um, that as a quality of human beings, we're leaving trash behind in space. So that's pretty erudite comment. Thank you, Eileen. Also, I just want to um, revisit the what I was saying to you before we went live at six, because a lot of people 
can we there is such ready access to videos if people go and watch video for deep it's called deep field space and you can get that sense that three-dimensional sense of going through space and you see all of the things that come towards you sorry for my lack of technical term of things but <laughs> um I, and, and I just want people to understand how courageous it is to go out into space. And it made me wonder, wow, how do they not hit anything? So I'd like to hear more about this because we look at the night sky, especially people who are not in dark sky areas where there's a lot of light pollution. So maybe you see, you know, a handful of stars and you don't realize the sheer blanket that is covering us every, you know, not every night, every moment of the planet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when I was growing up, we, we thought that space was a, a big void. There were stars out there and maybe some comets, maybe an asteroid or two, but, but space was empty. And now we're learning it's not quite so empty. But the good news is that most of these things are very far apart. So the chances of hitting them are very small. Except now when we talk about space debris, human created space debris around the Earth, that is starting to get somewhat crowded. But but the the, the concern is that the right type of collision between two larger pieces of that could create so many smaller pieces that could then interact with other pieces of space debris that it could really uh, create a very uh, dense problem. And, and that's what we need to work on and avoid so that we, we need to clean up the space debris before that kind of catastrophe happens. Because so we don't want to be like two galaxies uh, colliding. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that's not the right no. thing. I want, uh, to I want to interject with Eileen's um, next comment because it's kind of a question, and we're we are at that ten minute ten minute mark. Um, I wonder if anyone has read C.S. Lewis' The Space Trilogy. Out of this silent planet, he found space to be full of cosmic, God filled light. Well, that was C.S. Lewis for you. Uh, yes, that that was kind of his thing. So, uh, Michael, what you're nodding? What what did you have to say about Mr. Lewis? Well, uh, C.S. Lewis is really uh, an inspirational figure. I, that's uh, thank you for the, the the tip. I'm going to have to add that to my library. And look, I'm not familiar with, with that trilogy of uh, books, but. Even though looking up at the sky you know, today, there's so many satellites and other between drones and uh, active things that, you know, when we look up at the sky, you know, a lot of it, you know, it's mistaken. Or could that be a UFO or whatever? So uh, a lot of the, the, the pollution, you know, even though that it may not impact us, it really affects us with a clear view of the sky and, what, and what's out there. When we talk about the view of the sky, so now just the ordinary person, um, I'm being fortunate to live uh, next door to a small observatory in the middle of the big city. I have a little access to people with telescopes to see the larger bodies. But Joyce, won't you give us a little bit of a catalog of places that people can go free of charge to um, just to observe. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm from Los Alamos, White Rock area. Uh, the Pajarito Astronomers, of which I am a member, has a dark night that's free to the public at White Rock Overlook. Our next one is August 27th, a Saturday night. We try to do them during and around the new moon so you get a better view of the stars. If it's cloudy, we won't go out. So you might want to check our Facebook page and see what whether we're whether we think the prospects are good or not. Um, there are many parks. Um, Valles Valles Caldera was designated a national 
dark sky historic a dark sky site a couple of years ago. And I don't know for sure, maybe Heidi, who was on here today, could tell me whether they're starting up their programs, but they used to have a couple of programs per year uh, of, of viewing at the caldera. Um, Bandelier National Monument would have some, some dark night opportunities. Chaco Canyon used to do them. There's a, a group called the El Valle Astronomers, which you may have heard of. It may be in Taos area. Uh, they also have a Facebook page, so they may have some opportunities. Um, even some of the other, Fort Union National Monument has one thing a year, Jemez Springs. Um, if you would like to go to some live programs with lectures, the um, Pajarito Environmental Education Center has a planetarium. This is in Los Alamos, and on Friday nights they have a show. Uh, even tonight, they're having a show on the Webb Telescope right now that I'm, I'm not there. Tomorrow, they're going to have a show on the dark, what you can see in August, the dark, uh, the sky, the sky, night sky in August. So I would recommend all of those local things. There are many websites that give you information about what can be seen. Um, I would recommend go outside with a pair of binoculars and just look around. Um, there's the web app, an app on your phone, which I don't have called Stellarium, which is supposed to be good. It, show, it can give you, tell you what's up in the night sky and help you identify it if you hold your phone up there and uh, take, uh, it'll tell you what you're seeing. Um, what else? I subscribe to Sky and Telescope. You can't see it. Magazine. It's somewhere it's not coming into view. That has a lot of information every month on what you can see in the night sky. So you don't need a telescope. Just use your eyes. I have terrible vision. Um, just use your binoculars um, that I have right, right here that I used last night. And I got to see Vega. I got to see Deneb, Altair, Arcturus through the clouds. I mean, there are clouds. I looked through holes. The, the crescent moon. Um, Mercury is setting in the west, and that'll be getting better during the, during the month. And Saturn is rising in the east, and that'll be getting better during the month. So those are two two planets you'll be able to see this month. Uh, thank you. Fabulous uh, walk through what's possible. And Loretta, do us the favor of uh, listing your books uh, about uh, travel and space and, and those things. Do you by chance have any covers there that we can see? Just happen to have them. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Uh, this one is called Out of This World, New Mexico's Contributions to Space Travel, and it's, it's a, as far as I know, the only history book that's been written about new, the New Mexico's very important, very long-lasting contributions to getting man into space and supporting both the, the national space programs and also the new commercial space industry. I have Space Pioneers in Their Own Words, which is annotated excerpts of oral history and reviews of people who worked in space programs on Earth and as astronauts. The Complete Space Bus Bucket List. And by the way, one of the things you can do, it's 100 space things to do before you die, one of them is to wear space jewelry. So you two both have, oh, can yeah. check off okay. <laughs> your, that. that one for tonight. <laughs> Um, I have a children's book called Miguel and Michelle Visit Spaceport America. So children in New Mexico and their parents and grandparents can find out what, what that's all about. And then the standard version and children's version of Wally Funk's story. Oh, wonderful. So wonderful. Quite a variety. I could say that's an award winning book. Well, Just tout your ability. Yes. It has its little sticker on it. Um, a, what about Spaceport? Uh, are, is there any opportunity of visiting there for the public at this time? Uh, they, I believe, are still organizing tours. Uh, if you go to their website, I believe you can sign up and get information about taking a tour. It's, you can't just go out there by yourself and drive onto the property because it's a secure facility. But they do tend to uh, have an open house every year at the same time that Trinity site is open. 
because they're not that far apart. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, and they occasionally have a, a open houses at other times as well. Great, thank you. Um, I happen to know that um, the tour company out of uh, Santa Fe and Taos, Heritage Inspirations, does trips on the solstices to Chaco Canyon. Oh. And uh, Joyce, do you know of any others that um, offer trips with uh, a guide? I'm sorry, I don't know, but I think that any of these um, these parks will have a guide there if you go to the Bandelier uh, Star Gazing Night or the um, Fort Union um, Star Gazing Night. They have guides there that will tell you about the stars and about the mythology of the, in the constellations and all sorts of interesting things. Well, so, in the national yeah. parks also, uh, at Grand Canyon, um, uh, it, you'll have rangers who yes. will do night yeah. talks. And so yeah. not to discount some of those areas. Uh, I'm going to jump in and read some of the chat so that we have that oh, good. for everybody. Um, so this is Eileen again making a comment. Joni Mitchell wrote many years ago, with heaven full of astronauts and the Lord underthroned. And then she says, I could have that last word wrong. So I don't know because I'm not familiar, but maybe you guys do. Um, and then may I say that this is one of the most eclectic and interesting programs I've attended. What a wonderful breadth of perspectives. Maybe by looking from so many different perspectives, we can see more truly. And then Linda Hall says, it seems that the heavens have inspired the heart and the mind since the beginning of the human experience. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, everybody. Yeah, that, that's really nice. And uh, that's something that I, I was so pleased to hear when we happened to, by accident, travel with Michael mm -hmm. and hearing his take and listening to what he he spoke of when we were actually there in Egypt mm -hmm. and we were able to see some of these things it brought um well I wanted to be an archaeologist as a kid so nothing was unfamiliar but he brought that sen super sensibility that we're talking about to the fore and and so that was a whole different geometric uh perception of thought that I got out of what Michael had to say. Uh, so I, I believe we're kind of at the end of our program. Are there any other chats? I, there aren't any other chats, but I do need to say much gratitude to my friend and moderator, Sarah Francis, who is always here helping, uh, helping me and leading the conversation. Such a great gift for us to have you here with us, Sarah. And um, also Sarah has a wonderful, beautiful book, Fragments of Spirit, um, that you can check out. And the museum is open 10 to five daily uh, through, through um, October. And right now we are just having a new exhibition opening tomorrow, the National Pastel Society. So- And the gala, and mention the gala. Yes, it's our annual fundraiser. I didn't mention it because the tickets are sold out. So that's why I didn't mention it. But yes, it is. So well, it, for next year. <laughs> for next year. It's a big weekend for us here at the museum. And um, next month, we are speaking of the Pastel Society. So next month's Millicent Unplug is going to feature three pastel artists. So that'll be, that'll be fun. Um, so I hope you guys will join us. And to our three panelists, Again, thank you so much. I really want to think about some programming for 2023, some talks at the museum about um, the cosmos. And I think you all would be great. And ancient knowledge, because we really ancient didn't knowledge. mention how the Puebloans had their own ancient knowledge and, and mapping the, the skies. Ancient sky, right? And so we need an expert uh, on, on the Pueblo ability to yeah. um, deal with the heavens. Much so, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's it wonderful to meet you all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.